we will in fact have uh, three round tables, so you've noticed that they're actually linear rather than round, but uh, the concept is there. Um, and uh, in, the, in the first, um, the, the subject is the, uh, the financing of science, public versus private, and basic versus applied. And uh, we have uh, with us uh, three people that you've heard from this morning, uh, Miguel, uh, Brito and Mario, and also uh, Michael Deschamps, who is the managing director of the Perimeter Institute. And so, since he hasn't spoken to us yet, I'm going to ask him to speak, and perhaps particularly to talk about an aspect uh, that uh, wasn't so much at the forefront earlier, but is certainly at the forefront, I think, for the Perimeter Institute, which is the question of public versus private. And I'm going to ask him to speak for three minutes or so. Um, is actually this 
construction business. Um, he has a foundation, but in the past is only in the medical research, the hospitals, and cancer research. And this is always a very long process, so we bring something like that on board. This was a three-year process, and at one point during that process, what we realized is what really intrigues him, what he spends his time thinking about, is the big bang in the apples. And so here's a guy who knows he will never participate in science, but he understands what the possibilities are. He understands that you can do extraordinary work from investing in the people, and in his, in his case, in a research cluster to help advance the science. And I think I'll go back to my first point, Stop. We underestimate the power of that story and the fact that we have a very, very important story to tell. We can't only really talk from the scientists, we need to go from scientists and to the general public. And there is a very powerful story to tell to bring others on board and whether we're talking to public funders or private funders. What we're trying to do with the other day is bring more people into the tank. It's not as though some game, it's about growing the ball. Maybe people won't appreciate it. True value in investing in research, and I think we have very powerful stories. Thank you. I'd now like to ask our other panelists whether there's anything they'd like to uh, comment on about what their colleagues said this morning, any particular reactions they had to the other stories from other countries. Okay. Uh, one reflection I think is important is that there are very many tools through which public money can be invested into science. FAPESPI has given us a very good example by just uh, receiving a percentage of the total revenues in taxes of the state that goes directly into science. Uh, in the case of uh, private donors, which is not, of course, uh, the usual thing in Latin America, even those people get the possibility to discount it from their tax, uh, uh, they have their tax deduction there. Also, uh, the government uh, has the power to direct science in different directions. And I think that if you listen, for instance, to Mariana Mazzucato, who is a very well-known economist from Sussex in England, uh, most of the innovation has arised or arose from investment by the government. Later on, the private sector can use the, those results and build a lot of very different things. But I think the public investment is a must and cannot be uh, minimized. Then, of course, the problem whether it is going to be uh, investment for applied science or for uh, basic science, I think that you have to reach an equilibrium and that is a diff very difficult part to see what an equilibrium is, how much has to go in one direction, how much has to go in the other. Thank you. Well, probably it's the reality in the neighbor countries, but uh, uh, it's very difficult to get philanthropies to support science in my country. Very, very difficult. I have personally tried with the wealthiest person in Chile, and uh, uh, which I tried hard. We had several meetings, but uh, in the end, it was impossible. That's my that's my personal experience, but it's I think it's a more generalized situation. Um, in Conicet, uh, we had a program to insert new. PhD graduates in the industry and it has been very very hard even though the policy government is willing to provide the salary for a number of years for a new PhD to work in the industry we have find we have found that it is very very hard to find interest from the industry to accept those PhDs so I think uh, it's uh, this is a cultural issue in our country, in my country, and uh, probably has to do with the uh, lack of interest to take risks, and uh, perhaps because uh, the private sector in Chile 
has been uh, basing its uh, profit on the exploitation of natural resources. So it's very comfortable to stay in that state. And there, there, I, there isn't too much interest in innovate and take risk. That's uh, what I can tell from our experience. Well, are there tax advantages for donors in, in, uh, in Chile? As there are, I think, as you said, there are in Argentina. Well, there are, you cannot just donate money, you have to go through a legal process. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not so easy. You have to go through a series of uh, steps before you can donate money. And uh, we also have a law to incentivate um, uh, R&D in the industry. It has been uh, effective, but since we start from very low uh, numbers, we are now a little bit higher, but still it's a small fraction of the total of uh, uh, private uh, effort in R&D. Peter, do you want to make any comment? Brief comment to say that uh, <coughs> here in Brazil there is there is a growing interest in this idea of organizing a system for paying donations for science or for universities. Uh, how in the how the situation with such that examples of institutions which were built on donations and the cost of those There are hospitals here in St. Paul, like Albert Einstein, who was here in the day, who was here in the day, excellent hospitals, which are being started. There is in Brazil a legislation that offers a tax break for a person who would make a donation to a cultural activity which has to be approved by the Ministry of Culture, for example. And, uh, however, there are obstacles, like, for example, uh, the, normally the organization that creates or that is responsible for organizing this cultural activity cannot be a public organization. So if you are a public university, you cannot, you're, you're not entitled to get the tax benefit. You have to, you have to be a bank, for example. Uh, so that limits the, the, the effects of this. Does culture include science? Yeah, yeah that, that's where I was getting to. Unfortunately, in Brazil, culture does not include science. Actually, culture doesn't even include education. The definition is culture like movies or theater and so on. And there were a number of initiatives to, to make it, to change this legislation. Like one I've seen, a uh, representative proposed a, an amendment saying, uh, in Brazil, science and education are part of the culture to be added to the law. But it never passed in, in Congress. So the fact that there is no tax incentive, sometimes, in some cases, I'm not saying in all, but in some cases might be an obstacle. We have seen cases in which wealthy people wanted to, or actually made a donation, for example, to the University of Sao Paulo, to the library, the Mindling Library. This person had a beautiful collection of old books and everything, and then he decided to donate to the University of Sao Paulo, and he was taxed. So they had a two-year fight with the tax revenue service to, to resolve that. But anyway, the, the lack of this kind of incentives, I think, precludes the more effective use of this system in Brazil. Even though, and I'll finish by telling you that, I know that in some universities in Brazil, they are organizing to, uh, by, uh, there are in, uh, initiatives by alumni to organize endowments. I know that there is one at the University of Sao Paulo, one at the University of Campinas, one at the 
aeronautics technology institute, which are schools where the, the ex students keep a connection to the institution. So they are organizing an endowment with taxes, with everything, following the legislation. That's what I have to say here. Thank you. So now, um, are there, I invite questions from the audience to any of our panel members related to what they might have said this morning or anything else. Please. Thank you. Um, I have a question about Chile and one about Argentina. Uh, for Chile, you talked about an outreach program called Explora. I'd like to know which activities has Explora carried out that were most successful, um, that had the most impact, if you measure impact. And for Argentina, um, I heard that there is a repatriation program going on in Argentina to bring back Argentinian scientists. I was told that it's very successful. And I'd like to know if that's true and how it works. Thank you. Last question first. Uh, yes, and the program is called RAICES. It has repatriated uh, more than 1,000 scientists in Argentina in the last, uh, I don't know, six or eight years or ten years. And it continues. Of course, it is very much dependent upon the global conditions, not only conditions in Argentina, but uh, all I can say is that until now it has been a very successful program and I hope that it will continue in the future. Thank you for the question about Explora. Uh, Explora is a program that is uh, 20 years old already and uh, um, it has uh, a number of instruments to encourage uh, outreach among the community, within the community. Uh, we produce uh, lots of products uh, like books, audiovisual, audiovisuals. Uh, uh, we also um, encourage uh, professors or researchers to go to the schools to give talks we organize a national congress of, uh, uh, of science and technology for school kids. Uh, we do that first in regions and when we run a competition in the different regions of the country and then we meet in uh, November for the national congress in Santiago or elsewhere, it could be in some other city, but we, that's one very uh, success, successful uh, initiative of Explorer. So there are many examples of uh, many successful uh, stories, uh, initiatives within the Explorer. There are perhaps too many. We are working towards uh, making, having less, fewer um, uh, calls for projects or initiatives and be more focused. One successful initiative that happened this year is called the pilot of scientific culture. So it's a pilot program that is run in two regions of the country. Well, Santiago is a region, even though it's a metropolitan region, it's, it's one region, and then in the south of Chile. Uh, so the idea there is to, to make all the offer available uh, by the scientific community, and I'm, I'm referring to products, books, audiovisuals, uh, speakers, whatever, make that offer available to the teacher in the school. Um, why? Because in the past, the researchers, um, uh, like the direct center or an individual researcher, had an idea, and he just got funding to do that idea, to implement it to produce a book or something else. And then there was an avalanche of uh, products uh, on the head of the teachers of the schools. And the teachers are already very busy, very busy. And so if you put more, more work on their shoulders, it's uh, very hard to, to have a successful result. So instead, what we are doing is we are asking the teachers to uh, we are asking them to tell what they need from us and from the community. So we want to make the offer, the outreach offer, available 
to the teacher and have the teacher tell us what he or she wants. And it has been very successful. We're working with the Ministry of Education because it needs a coordination with the teachers, the public schools. And, uh, and we are working with the curriculum uh, division of the Ministry of Education in order to incorporate uh, science, the, the, the teaching of science, from the very beginning. And in that way, the teacher will have uh, motivation, or he will be recognized for uh, doing that, for, doing, uh, for teaching science. And the scientists will provide their products to um, support that uh, initiative from the teacher. And it has been very successful, and we are now asking funds to the government to expand this pilot program to the rest of the country. Uh, thank you, Peter. I just wanted to correct an omission in my my talk here, which is when, when Branca asked it, I, I remember the case. Uh, that we have here with us today two persons who are giving from their own money to organize a fund to have a research grant organization, which are Ron and Branca who are there. And they are now, they finished the selection of a director for the organization, and it will be a science funding organization. They discussed this at length for the last two years with the science community in Brazil, with the Brazilian Academy of Science and several other researchers, and they have a plan for that. So they are giving from their money sizable amount to create this organization. It's a very nice and interesting example, and we are looking forward to have this operating. It might encourage other people to do the same. So I have a question, uh, mostly for Brito Cruz. Uh, funding for science in Brazil is facing extremely challenging times. Um, not only there was these severe cuts that you have shown, uh, but also there is a change in the structure of the ministry. Uh, ministry has been merged with communications. A week ago we learned about the new structure. Uh, where science has a very, very low uh, position. Then there is a proposal to freeze the, the public spending for 20 years, which would affect science. So the first question, and I guess probably Luis Davidovic, the uh, Brazilian Academy of Science president, will, will probably mention this tomorrow. But then the first question is, uh, how do you view this, this national situation, which will of course affect uh, Sao Paulo State, uh, am I wrong or are there other possibilities? That's the first question. Uh, the second one is a bit uh, related to what you just said. Uh, in Brazil, we don't have a lot of tradition of private foundations. The, the great exception is this one that's been funded now with the Morais, Morira Salles family. So do, do you think in this uh, sort of difficult future that we foresee, uh, is uh, public, uh, private funding one of the alternatives that is being explored by the state and the federal uh, uh, agencies not to, not to deal with the money but to figure out ways of stimulating more uh, donations of that kind? Uh, well, yes, I've undoubtedly Brazil, well, Brazil got itself, I was going to say, but Brazilians got themselves in a, in a difficult situation, right? Um, you have seen in the figure that I've shown this morning that the decrease in funding from the, from the Ministry of Science and Technology has started in 2013. I think the peak there was 2013. So there is a, a, a situation in which because the Brazilian economy was kind of broken, it will suffer for some time to fix it. And we are seeing that here in Sao Paulo, even though there is no, no, there are no cuts, the government follows the law. FAPESP gets 1% of the state revenues. However, because the economy is almost dead, the state revenues are small. So 1% of the state revenues this year means less money than last year. So we have had, it was necessary to adopt several measures to prioritize, to have things which are more important, which are being funded like we were in 2000 and 
2010 or 2011 and other things which we are funding less. And I don't see any easy or painless way out of it. So for the next 10 years, I see Brazil and Sao Paulo suffering this, the consequences of things which were done in the past. That's uh, one, the, the, the comment for your first question. The, for the second question, the thing is that uh, I, 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 am, I believe we are already seeing this. We are seeing organizations look for alternatives to public funding. And we are seeing universities doing that, foundations doing that, and I think we will see more of this. It is something that I believe is healthy for our system, but it's not healthy to consider that donations will compensate for the loss of public funding. Donations might help you to live a little longer or something, but it's not a, a substitute. So you need actually to have both things, and they are most of the time complementary. One enters where the other does not, and they add. The, 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 the thing is that there is this one, should comment on this, since you asked about the, the difficulties. There is this difficulty in the Brazilian, especially in the higher education community, because there is this love which sometimes becomes irrational for public funding. And then if you get a donation, people tend to, students and some faculty tend to oppose the university from receiving the donation because they see that as a privatization of the university, which it's not. But it's, well, one of the, there are many others, one of the irrational things that occurring in Brazil in the last years. So, yeah, I have a question for Carlos. Um, so, one other, uh, talking about the last comment, one other rational thing that happens again and again in South America is that science policies change extremely quickly. They swing back and forth depending on the government that happens to be at that time. And something that was very striking in your presentation is somehow Sao Paulo has figured out a way to get politicians to at least have some steadiness in the science policy. So I'm hoping, do you have any words of wisdom that you can turn to your right and tell the other countries and the other places that are being represented here to see how in the world Sao Paulo managed to get politicians to at least do not mess too much with science? I'm not sure I know how to answer that. When you ask it for words of wisdom, I would say maybe we should pray. <laughs> but the thing is that it, here in the state of Sao Paulo there was a lucky situation, it seems to me, in which smart persons built this foundation and built an institutional, uh, institutional structure for the foundation. And the foundation worked well and obtained some a high degree of legitimacy with society, with the scientists, and with other parts of society. So much so that, for example, in 1989, when there was a, they were re -re they were rewriting the state constitution, our percentage changed from 0.5 percent to 1 percent. So actually, the revenues for the foundation were doubled, in, and the government agreed to that, and the industrialists agreed to that, and the science community did that. So what we try to do at FAPESP is to, is to be prudent, is to, to make sure the foundation un understands what is in the mind of the, first of all, the, the citizen, the taxpayer, and how what is in their mind migrates to the mind of the politicians, because it does. What they say to us is not something that they invent, they say because they are looking for votes and they learn that people will vote if X happens and Y does not happen. So we try to keep those connections and... Yes, uh, I want to... I mean, uh, um, I want to... 
mention about the way you decide which are the policies to, I mean, to finance sciences. And what I want to bring is the existence in the last 15, 20 years of a new field in physics, which is complex networks. Uh, one of the, uh, the things that the people in complex networks look at are at large communities, large populations, and they see their needs, their trends, etc., etc. So, uh, I mean, following in a way what Brito said that how Brazil had decided which were the, the policies, is what I would like to, to mention is that it may be interesting considering that this that you have here is the community that works precisely on those complex networks. You don't have to go outside. Uh, I mean, to, to study precisely the needs of the community in order to establish the policies and not to think that a brainstorming of a, of a few, I mean, very prepared and intelligent people will, will be the ones who decide, but really get the information from the bottom, which as a, up until now, it has been very difficult to do, but nowadays we have the tools. So, and is this the community that has the tools? So, I would like to know if you have any ideas about that. Any comments? Yeah, the and there's not a question, sorry. I, I think the question is that now you, one can get, uh, one can in some sense crowdsource the suggestion oh, okay. as to what you might do in science from the scientific sure. community. Well, this is one of the options that we are exploring nowadays, crowdfunding, but uh, I insist, I think, that in our countries uh, we should be lucky if we can raise the contribution from the private sector to, let us say, 40 or 50 percent. But I think it's the decision making that's being talked about here. Oh, sorry. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure to say that what you have to get is the whole. I am not saying that what you have to get are the contributions towards, yeah. let's say, the funds from the people in the community. But They're to know what it. the community needs, yes. when oh, you okay, say. Yeah, it's the decision making. So okay, okay, okay. Yes. Sure, that, that is certainly the way we, we have to go. Uh, to begin with, we have to look at the other ministries, and that is something we are doing. We are planning uh, calls for grants that are being uh, adopted by other ministries. And also, we are in contact with the civilian society all the time. For instance, uh, there is a federal program in which we go to the uh, how do you say internet as in English, the mayors of the cities uh, and ask them their needs and we look for a way in which science be inserted within the needs of the community. Certainly that is true and that is the only way through which science is going to be really adapted by the community. I'm not sure if I understood the question but I will try to give an answer. <laughs> I think uh, in my country uh, it has been very, very hard to get an increase of public funding uh, for science and technology. We have seen an increase, but it has been leveling off. So now it's, it's getting harder and harder, especially because there are a lot of social demands. People are demanding for better edu free education, uh, better health, uh, better retirement plans, and so on. So it's, it's very hard for science to compete with all, 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 that, all those demands. I think the way to have a quantum step up, hopefully not down, is to set the priorities first, set goals, identify scientific pro problems, that projects or ideas that will solve the problems of the people. And I think we will have to do that uh, exercise and in that way, we will be able to convince the state, the government, to fund, uh, to give extra funds for science. Well, perhaps I could just develop that slightly into a question. The, the title of this uh, round table was uh, Public versus Private and Basic versus uh, Applied, as though these are two different axes. 
and we've already had some sorts of comments about the correlation between these two axes. Uh, and we've had a lot of comments about the, the, the in order to convince governments and the electorate to uh, contribute larger budgets to science, then there have to be predetermined objectives. Does this mean that uh, that truly blue skies research, to use that phrase, research, curiosity driven research without predetermined objectives is only going to flourish where there is private funding? And will that work against some countries rather than others that we would, it would then militate against those countries that don't have private funding? Private donors obviously want to be extremely motivated, but they don't necessarily require the same at times bureaucratic box ticking about what you've done or what you intend to do. I don't know if any of us would like to comment on that. I mean, Michael, maybe you want to. Sure. So I would, from my part of the world, I would say that the answer to that is no. Um, I think, I think, uh, so Brito made an, an interesting comment this morning about how um, Brazil is doing quite well now because it did foundational work a while back. And I think one of the struggles is to really effectively communicate the relationship between those things on the research chain. And at the Perimeter Institute, for example, we do fundamental research. We do, we do basic research and nothing but, and we don't pretend we do anything else. But what we do do is spend quite a bit of time explaining how that fits into the research chain. And the fact that you can't cherry pick where you invest that you can't only focus on innovation. I mean, we live in a times when young people um, code and make three million dollars or a billion dollars selling a company. There's a, there's a sense of, of instant gratification. We were talking about that before. But the the idea that you have to invest on all, in all places on the research chain and that you can show historically that that is a very, very smart thing to do and you can't ignore the front end um, I think it is a discussion that we all have to work very, very hard to make. Any other comment? Uh, well, I think now, an interesting that this, this fascinating discussion is, we must now bring this round table to a close and go on to the next one. But of course, I'd like to thank our four uh, contributors here for what they've contributed earlier in, at this session. Thank you very much. <laughs>